princess has been captured. There's one. Set for stun. Our heroes are threatened by an Imperial troop transporter. Will the mighty force of the Millennium Falcon be enough to smash Darth Vader? Will Luke be able to save the princess? Only you can decide. Look for the new Palatoy Star Wars models in toy shops now. But hurry. The 1970s. Filmmaker George Lucas is about to launch a visionary new film that will revolutionize cinema. This is not that story. Hey guys, Terry from Big Cosplay here. We've got a very, very special guest tonight. Uh, we have David Whiteley, BBC presenter from the UK, uh, also massive Star Wars fan, hence all the Star Wars bits and pieces. So today, tonight, is a bit of a Star Wars thing. So uh, he's got his headphones off right now because he's watching the intro. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce David and um, as soon as he turns his phone to silent. <laughs> so guys, um, uh, please just uh, you know give a warm welcome to, to David Whiteley. And, uh, and, thank, and again, David, thanks so much for coming along. Oh, it's my pleasure. I was just watching the intro there. It was just absolutely fantastic, Terry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, blo I'm blown. I'm blown away. It was just like, I thought, should I stop watching now? Should I join in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, just, I, I decided to ham it up just a little bit. <laughs> that was great. It was really fantastic. So, thank you for the for the very special intro. Thank you. That's all right. So, I've I've uh, I just let everybody know that you're a BBC presenter um, at the mm -hmm. moment, and uh, you've been doing a lot of these uh, interviews and uh, live streams and bits and pieces for. A few different people, and you've just been, you know, great to come on with me. This is fantastic. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very flattered to be asked, Terry. So, thank you very much. You know, it's. Uh, I noticed that your your libation of choice is a beer at this, your time of day, and mine is a mine is a coffee because it's uh, it's beer you know, o'clock. Just gone eleven. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the pubs are open at ten. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah. To be fair, they're not they're not they're not yet open here. We've got oh. a, we've got a bit longer to wait yet. Yeah, they're I think I think we've actually got a few pubs open at the moment, which is good. Um, so anyway, let's kick straight into it. Um, now, you are all you're a presenter, and also at the same time, you. Um, I'm not sure if you directed or produced um, the thirty minutes. Uh, a, bit, a bit of everything. A bit, a of, everything. bit of everything. So, of everything? Yeah. So, so tell us about Pally Toys. Tell us about the uh, the Toy Empire. I tell you about Toy Empire first. Okay, so that was that was kind of the, the most recent documentary that, that we made for about Star Wars. So um, we'd made the Galaxy Britain built. We'd made the ninety minute documentary, and, I, and I'd written the book. And um, you know, yeah, we're going to come in, back to the documentary in the book. So we'll, we'll, cool. we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get a reverse order. <laughs> but yeah, but the uh, Toy Empire uh, came about because um, you know I'm a massive Star Wars fan as a kid. You know, I was I was born on May the fourth, Star Wars Day seventy seven. Um, so yeah, I was always surrounded by, by the mm. toys and, and everything. And I've got, you know, some of my collection behind me here. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we wanted to tell the story of, um, the kind of British side of, of the toys. So mm -hmm. of course you had, you had Kenner in the, in the U S got the, got the contract. Um, they were the guys making, making the, the toys, yep. but they wanted a, a British subsidiary and Palatoy was part of the, of the same group. So um, Palatoy, very successful uh, in Britain at the time. They were making mainline train sets. Uh, they were doing Action Man. Um, oh, like Action Man. <laughs> exactly. You remember Action Man. I don't know what happened to my Action Man. They've all disappeared. Um, and Tiny Tears. And they were, they were doing very well with these things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, another, another toy group, another toy di division in the group was approached by General Mills, uh, who owned all the companies. And they said, look, um, they went to the guys that made Spirograph. <laughs> they mm -hmm. said to them, do you want to take on Star Wars? And they said, oh, no, we've got a deal coming with with, with another company. Um, so you guys can take Star Wars at, at Palatoy. And the MD at the time said, are you sure? Are you really? Are you <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, we've got to deal with something else. So anyway, so of course, you know, this 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 all came about. So, so Palatoy took um, the contract for, for Star Wars. Um, and then, you know, their, their factory is in a uh, small town. Uh, in Leicestershire, middle of middle of Britain, middle of England. Um, so a place called Colville. So you had coal mines there, hence the name. And the only other sort of main kind of work, if you like, was the was the Palatoy factory. Mm -hmm. um, so you either you either worked down the mines, or you worked. Or you made the, toys. The you made yeah. toys. You know. So so what a choice. Um, and and you you had the the designers there, 
and of course the, the factory staff as well. So what was interesting was that was that the guys at Palatoy were kind of given not free reign, but a bit more carte blanche to to change things a bit because of course mm -hmm. in America you've got a, a big uh, market ten times the size of the UK, so they could in, do injection molding and all that kind of stuff and spend a lot of money on the equipment to make the toys. Whereas in in little old Blighty, you know, they had to kind of come up with cheaper ways of <laughs> making the toys, which <laughs> they did. And, that, and I think one of the, the biggest collectible items, Terry, is the is the Palatoy cardboard Death Star in the States. Oh, it was this yeah, big plastic was, thing. Yeah. Oh. Did you ever did you did you Oh no, see no, this no. Thing? I was I, I I've seen one. I've actually seen one. Because I when I was yeah. watching the little the uh, the documentary, I was like I've seen one of those. I have actually seen one back when I was a kid, but then I've never seen one since. No, no, I, I saw them in the shops. I never had one. I had my Falcon. I've still got my Millennium Falcon, but the but the Palatoy um, cardboard Death Star is goes for far more than the the plastic ones now because because you know they're they're so rare because they're cardboard. Of course, they yeah. got destroyed. Kid, kids were playing with them and they, <laughs> they took no time at all to destroy it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, to, to to destroy the Death Star. So so these guys are kind of you know, changing things and adapting things and beg borrowing and stealing bits from different uh, play sets. So they would take the, the cannons from the X-Wing and put them on the top of the Death Star and all that kind of stuff. And what was interesting for me when we, when we made that doc, um, incidentally, a friend of mine, Rick, came to me with the idea and he said, you know, we should, we should do this. I said, do you think people are really going to be interested in this story about Palatoy? And of course, you know, <laughs> lots of people were. Um, and and you know the, the the guys who were trying to market Star Wars, they had a real job. It, it kind of it almost kind of mirrored kind of the, the parallel had the parallels of, of George Lucas mm -hmm. hawking the script around of Star Wars, trying to get it off the ground and trying to get a, a movie studio interested. It was the same really for the for the for the retailers in in the UK. A lot of them didn't see it doing very well. We mm. we were at a disadvantage here, or they were. I was going to say that the, the Royal We, like I was part of the team. I feel like I was. <laughs> I spent so much time working. Oh, you on spent it. so much time with them doing the, doing it. Yeah, it's, yeah, you, you did. And 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 um, because in the states it came out May twenty fifth, seventy seven, and in the mm -hmm. UK, um, Star Wars didn't hit. I think it was May. It was uh, December twenty seventh, seventy seven. So most people didn't get to see it in the UK till sort of early part, maybe even spring. Uh, 78 because obviously now we're, we're so used to everything being released at the same time instantly same, it's like you know, it's there instantly yeah. in every multiplex you know but in the uk they, it was rolled out and there are only so many copies of the prints of star wars so they were kind of they were taken around the country and gradually people got to see star wars so mm -hmm. by the end of 78 most people had seen star wars who wanted to see it but it took a long time you know so there's been almost two years there where people mm -hmm. it had been released in the states and then before people had seen it here. So that kind of, they were having to try and convince the retailers that there was longevity in it and they would be able to kind of, you know, that people would still be interested in Star Wars a year, two years afterwards. And of course, that's before the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi came <laughs> And all the rest of it, yeah. <laughs> and all the rest, and all of it, everything else. <laughs> oh. So yes, yeah, so, so it was it was, it was was quite an interesting um, situation. So we went along to and the place in Leicestershire, Colton. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, it's no longer the factory, but it's, there's a conference centre there, and it's pretty much as it was back in the day. So okay. you've got all these guys who, were, who worked at Palatoy, all stayed friends over the years, all um, maintained contact with each other, and they had these reunions. And they're saying, oh, yeah, over here we did the designs, and in this this was the office where we had we took the orders, and over here was the factory floor. So we go into this place where, um, in fact, it didn't make... It didn't make the final cut of the film, but um, we go into this place, the plastics factory, mm -hmm. and that was where the figures were all being made, and all the and all the you know the attacks and the yeah, I saw a couple of shots of that, off the, and I was, I was yeah. like, oh, production line. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, the great thing is, and and this, there's so much stuff didn't make didn't make the dock, but um, apparently, uh, if you worked there, at Palatoy, I think it was on a Friday, you could go into the factory outlet shop on on the site okay and you literally for five pounds you could fill a bin bag full of star wars toys stuff that maybe was a slight defect or packaging <laughs> wasn't quite right so, so so, somebody somebody's got a garage full of full of full of uh toy bits yeah yeah <laughs> they will have and 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 what's what's really sad and and not i mean people have i mean we did put this in the dock i know other people are exploring this this fact is that when when kind of star wars came to an end in mm -hmm. that period um sort of the mid 80s 
when you could go to Woolworths and buy a pack of six for 99 pence. Um, they had they had all this, this stock left and they literally it went into landfill. So there's this fabled landfill site somewhere. That everyone's out there with, with, with plastic detectors. <laughs> beep, beep, yeah, beep, but, beep, beep. <laughs> and I did say to people, would you want to go? And they were like, it's been in there like 30 years. Do you really want to go down and get that amongst all the nappies and everything else? It's Maybe probably not. still intact. <laughs> probably is. If, some, if people are prepared to dig for it, then I'm sure I'm sure they would. But but also, I mean, yeah, there was skip diving. So obviously stuff would, would end up in skips. Mm. And uh, the local kids, they knew this. So they'd go around the back of the factory and dive in the in the skip. And I, I remember meeting this lady. She said to me that her husband used to do skip diving. And one day, the headmistress, she found out that he'd been skip diving. He was all into the office. He thought, oh, I'm in trouble Ooh. now. And she said, right. She said, now listen, the next time you go skip diving, can you try and get my son a Millennium Falcon? <laughs> <laughs> so everyone wanted Star Wars uh, in, the, in the area. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, you yeah, Market forces kind of kind of ended up meaning that that Palatoy was was sold off, which was which was very sad. Uh, and then it sort of changed hands a few times, and it's kind of the mid nineties when it kind of finally finally closed up. Yeah, I think um, the last owner was Hasbro, was it? That's right. Yeah, of yeah. course Hasbro. Now, um, obviously, since then, I've got had the contract to, to make to make Star Wars toys, and they still do mm. a fan, fantastic job. I've got a few of them kicking around in, in my office, you know. But but I I, I think that there was certainly a sense talking to the people that, that worked there terry that they that was a great time in their lives you know wonderful time to kind of be together because they were making toys and they all got on really well you know and they all had a great maybe, time. maybe maybe for not for not for the girls on the production floor <laughs> no <laughs> take an arm well, take said, an arm take well, a body yeah. take a leg take a leg head yeah. click snap, done. Snap, snap. Next. that was it they snapped <laughs> them all together and um and and that was all that was all perfect you know and that's what that's what they did and they kind of it was um, a to every one they did, they got paid for. So that's that's mm. how they got that's how they got their how they got their money. That's a, that's a pretty good way of doing it, actually. Yeah, that's how they that's how they kind of worked it. But um, but yeah, there's a real sense of I don't know. You, you go there, you think, well, what a sad sad story, really, because the, at the one point it was you know the epicenter for children's toys, not just Star Wars toys. As I mm. mentioned earlier, Action Man and, and Mainline and Tiny Tears and so much came out of there, and they had to be innovative with their design. And uh, then it all just kind of it all just kind of fizzled out. Yeah, toys unfortunately these days is a massive business. Mm-hmm. And um, but I mean, you know, it's making making collectibles. They become replicas, and they've just there's, there's no money in it unfortunately. So I don't think they'd be able to continuously roll those sort of things out. Plus, uh, I don't know if you had any of those Palatoy um, Star Wars figures, but I remember having one or two when I was a kid. And uh, even though I wasn't a Star Wars fan, I still had one or two in the Lego box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rather large Lego figures. Yeah, no, I did. I've, I've still got them. And and, and um, they've started to kind of reproduce the, the original ones, the retro figures, they're calling them now. So you can buy the, you can buy the kind of uh, retro figures. Of, yeah, the molds were terrible. They were. <laughs> the, well, they were. The, I mean, the detail uh, was just not there. The... <laughs> But that didn't bother me. I mean, they no, now, they it never now bothered kind of, anyone now, back then. We had we had imaginations course, you, then. <laughs> you just had you just had you just had Star Wars, and you had Star Wars in your hand. I'm trying to find one here. That of the, 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 I mean, the uh, where's Han Solo here? Um, with the with the there we go. These are the oh, he's still in a box. Ones. Oh, this is a rex, retro. No, 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 it's, no, it's retro. It's oh, a replica. Yep. But they're they're not the ones from the original time. But they're you know that's as you say. How is that Harrison Ford? But yeah. I'm going to do something here, and I'm just going to flip my video around because every time I try and look at you, I am. There we go. In reverse. Now I can. Now I can look at you. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I'm walking off the screen. It's going. It's going away. He's had it up already. We only just begun. Yeah, it's, it's like oh, I just want to. No, 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 <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but now I can actually look at you and talk at you and point at you on the screen. <laughs> That's it. Great. Yeah, you're there. You're there. It's yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I mean, and obviously at the time it was George Lucas was very clever, wasn't he? And, and the merchandise really kind of fueled that. Uh, that, that oh, it was uh, massive. Uh, yeah, because because you know, three years between movies as well. You got to keep that interest going. Mm. You got to keep the children interested. Uh, of course, there were the, the fabulous comics, um, but to have to have the merchandise, whether it's you know the the, the figures and the and the vehicles, 
or the or any books or you know stationary sets or whatever it may be with Star Wars on it that was going to keep the interest going. So, all right, let's talk about the documentary. So well, going backwards here. Built. Yes, okay, the Galaxy well, written built. Okay, well, I tell you what I do. I'm gonna I'll, sh I'll share my screen here, um, yep. and I'll show you I'll show you some some pictures here from from. Um, I hope you hopefully you can see this. Is that is that? Can you see that there? Is that okay? Yep. Is that working with you? Okay, so so okay, the Galaxy Britain built was. The, you can go. You can go to present to slideshow mode. So just click click play. Oh yeah, slideshow mode. Okay, so then hit. Okay, cool. Right. So you should see that now. Yeah, cool. Okay, there you go. so perfect. So the Galaxy, perfect. So the, the Galaxy Britain built the British force behind Star Wars. This was this was something that. Um, First of all, came about um, when my, with my sort of passion for Star Wars kind of reignited, um, and it was following the release of The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens came out um, in December 2015, mm -hmm. and I went to see it unashamedly nine times at the cinema. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was I was hooked. It had it had everything I wanted for Star Wars. It had the new, fabulous new characters in Finn Ray and Kylo Ren. And, and, and then you also had the nostalgia as well with the old characters, the legacy characters. And I just felt like Star Wars. It was just brilliant. And I, I was really excited about it. And then I was on a way, my way back from a shoot. I've been in London filming something for my, for my TV show, my, my current affairs program on, on BBC One. And um, I was just flicking idly through Twitter. And I saw that Mark Hamill was doing a, a, an interview at the Cambridge Student Union. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to get Mark Hamill in the can and talk about his time filming in Britain? So, of course, everyone else wanted to do the same thing. So I contacted the student union. They, they contacted Mark, and he said, yeah, he was happy to do it. Um, unfortunately, it didn't come about in the end. But I thought that this kind of this kind of um, fueled me, if you like, to kind of do something do something more official. So mm -hmm. I contacted Disney, and Disney were, were very cool. I had, a, I had a chat with them in their offices in London. Um, my, one of my best friends, Matt, um, who, who was a director on the project, came with me for this meeting and they said we could film at Star Wars Celebration. And this was 2016. So I went back to my bosses and I said, look, I've got this, I might have an in here, I might be able to do something on on, on uh, the British people who made Star Wars. The title came to me straight away, The Galaxy Britain Built. I thought that's, that kind of says what it does, what it says on the tin. Um, and, and off we went. So so we first of all filmed at, um, at uh, Celebration. Um, how do I go to the next slide here? Uh, press space, I think. Space, there we are. Is it going to play? No, it's not playing. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, it's gone back too, what, too far. So how do I go back one? There we are. All right, so this is so this is when we filmed uh, Star Wars. Look, so I'm wearing the same T-shirt. I do own other T-shirts. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you're wearing that same T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, I have several of those. So here we are with with um, this is the very first interview we, we did uh, for the Galaxy Britain Bill. And this is Nick Maley, who um, worked um, in the creature department, creature-making department on, on Star Wars. And he was very instrumental in, in helping make all the creatures for Star Wars. And as you can see here, uh, he helped make Yoda as well. So he mm -hmm. made Yoda and the Empire Strikes Back. So I got that interview in the can. He was very emotional and uh, we, we had loads of stuff from Star Wars Celebration. And then the kind of the ball kind of got rolling a bit. And then I contacted, um, uh, I managed to get an address for, for John Moller, who was the, the costume designer. Mm -hmm. He's sadly no longer around. But he mm. won an Oscar for, for, for his, his Star Wars designs. And also won an Oscar for Gandhi, and he used to be a, a military historian, and he and he he, um, he was an advisor uh, for for David Lean on Doctor Zhivago, and then mm -hmm. uh, Peter Beale, who was the exec 20th Century Fox in London, recommended him and one other person to George Lucas, and George really liked really liked John Mollo's work, so he hired John, and John had the you know obviously you get fabulous um, concept art from Ralph McQuarrie. Mm -hmm. And it was John's job to take that concept art and turn it into something that could be wearable, that actually would, would be practical and could work on screen. So he would he worked on Darth Vader's costume and Princess Leia's and uh, Stormtroopers and Han Solo, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And, and when we filmed with him, he, he opened up his sketchbooks and they were sort of tucked away for goodness knows how, decades. And he opened them up and there was all this stuff from the 1970s, you know, where he'd done all the all the sketches, um, all the kind of the progression as well, the progression of this stuff. So, so where something hadn't quite worked and but parts of it had, he'd kind of move it around and, and then do the next bit. So that was fantastic. So we got John in the can. And then this gentleman, um, this gentleman is, uh, well, a legend in, in the world of filmmaking, Robert Watts. 
um, he was the production supervisor uh, mm -hmm. on Star Wars. Um, after Star Wars, I'll just do this as an aside, he, he went on to, to, to um, be very instrumental in The Empire Strikes Back, was the producer on Return of the Jedi, and uh, worked on the first three Indiana Jones films. In fact, he produced Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade. So he, this guy was like, he's still around. He's a fa fabulous guy and, and, and become a great friend. And this is at L Street. So this is L Street Studio 8, the soundstage here where, where Robert spent much of his life um, kind of, uh, you know, filming and make, making, making wonderful movies. And so here we are sitting in his studio. And he said to me afterwards, he said, nobody's ever interviewed me for as long as this. And it was only about an hour. <laughs> and I thought, really? You know, you're like, you know, you're instrumental in six of the most amazing movies of all time. Why has nobody sat you down and had a long conversation with... with it's called Unsung like Heroes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right, Terry. I think, I think and that was, was the mantra, really, with what we were hoping to do with the, with the doc, was this kind of... I give these people a bit of a bit of a, you know, a bit of um, a bit of credence, really, and, and a bit of screen time, a bit of a bit, a bit of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, majority of uh, the names on the credits at the end of a movie, no one ever sees. <laughs> no, <that's right. laughs> you get that's to that right, last, you get to that last scene, and Ooh. then the first credit rolls, and mm. you've you've already flicked off. So um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So so you know, to get these guys and to tell from their point of view how Star Wars came about. Um, I mean, you know, Robert got the wonderful deal with with Elstree Studios. He got he went to Pinewood and he tried to he tried to hire Pinewood, and they said to him, "We never rent, you know, the entire all the sound stages, everything to to one production, which is what they wanted for Star Wars because they knew they needed vast amounts of area, yeah, huge amounts of studio space and workshops." Uh, so anyway, so he said, "Okay," and he went to Elstree and, and he told the guy there, Andrew Mitchell, who ran the place at the time. He mm -hmm. wanted to rent the whole place. And he said, <laughs> be my guest. And they rented the whole place, you know, all the sound stages, all the workshops, all the land for £75,000. So they had the whole place where they could make the creatures in the workshops, they can make the sets and everything. And it was pretty much all done there. So because apart from filming in Tunisia, where they filmed, you know, all the Tatooine stuff and the odd shots here and there, it was pretty much all done at Elstrip. Mm. Um, you know, all the and stuff. And 70, 75,000 know. pounds is, is a drop in the well for a $4 million budget. Yeah, yeah. And it was $4 million to start with, and it kind of increased a bit more, but it, did, mm. it didn't come much with that. Now, here we are. This needs no introduction. The Holy um, Grail. This, this... Yep. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So um, here we have um, Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. Well, actually, it was, was Anakin's uh, beforehand. Um, but actually, the, the, the educated uh, among you will know that that's a Graflex handle of a 1940s press camera. So, so um, you know, you had the you had the camera where you had the flash bulb go off, yep. and you press that red button, it go poof. So, Roger Christian, um, I'll just pop onto his one here. He is Roger Christian, um, set decorator, uh, another. He won an Oscar um, as part of being part of the, um, the design team on on Star Wars, mm -hmm. and um, it was his job to kind of make a lot of the stuff for pretty much nothing. So, um, because the budget was so tight. They had to make do, and I think this is this is how Star Wars came about. The aesthetic we all know and love now, from the last forty plus years, came from these guys' ingenuity, really, because they didn't have much money. So uh, Roger and his and his boss John Barry, John Barry was um, was was in, in charge of the production design. He came up with this idea of of getting old aeroplane parts. You know, so they mm -hmm. flew around to all these different places in England where they were kind of, you know, plain graveyards and they'd come back with all this junk <laughs> and they try and find stuff that was really interesting within that, uh, that looked like it was functionable or looked like it had a purpose, but, but it would be unrecognizable once sort of broken down. Mm. So he had all this, all this stuff, all this junk. Um, in fact, Roger's book has a lot of it in there. Cinema Alchemist is a fantastic book. Talks about where they are going around all these different sites to kind of get this stuff. It Sounds broke it like down. cosplay. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. It's the same kind of mantra, isn't it? To yep, be fair, yep. Terry, it's, it's, it's thinking, well, does that look like it has a function? So if you were making something for a, for a costume, you would look at something and think, well, does that look like it has a place in this? If you saw um, my storage shelf it. over here with all the bits and pieces. <laughs> what, yeah. in the Death Star? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could probably make one. Yes, I could, yeah, you probably could, to be fair, from scratch. From scratch, you might be emperor on your case, asking to build it and get the, the six or seven Death Star. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, so he, he would, and he also got, you know, weapons, a Sterling submachine gun and, and put bits of, of um, uh, T-strip around it 
Mm -hmm. uh, he also did the, he, he took the Mauser, which he made into to, um, Han Solo's weapon, but he couldn't find anything for the for the lightsaber, and, and production was getting very very close. They were due to ship out to Tunisia, driving all the way from you know crossing the, the channel and then driving all the way down to Tunisia with all the stuff. Um, and he went into a camera shop where they hired a lot of stuff. And um, he went through some boxes and he found a load of these things, the flash guns. And he said, this is it. So he said to me in the interview that he hardly did anything with it. He just put some T-strip around it. But a bubble strip from an old calculator in the clip. I saw the bubble strip stuff. there. Yeah. That's it, yeah. And, they put, and then and George Lucas just said, I'll put a belt hook on it, put a belt loop. And that's it. It's done. So so there we are. That's the that's the actual the actual handle. Um, and John Steers was was instrumental in, in um, making the, the blade work. It rotated and they had 3M reflective material on it. So then, so in those early days of kind of animating the, the lightsaber, that's what, that's what they did. I mean, it was so incredibly um, creative and the ingenuity, um, you know, back in, back in the mid seventies. And Roger said, look, if it, if it looked right, then it went in. That was, the, yeah. that was what, that's what happened. Um, so, it, it, you know, <laughs> Necessity is is the mother of invention, isn't it? So it's I, the I mother think, of all uh, evil. <laughs> yeah, well, I think <laughs> yeah. as well. I, I think I think oh. had it not been for these guys, kind of just thinking, sort of beg, borrowing, and stealing things um, to kind of make things work, then you wouldn't have the look uh, of Star Wars oh, that, that exactly. we have today. Mm. I mean, so just just the, just the creativity you know? of actually being able to just you know go off on a basic sketch mm. idea and go, oh, I'll slap this together. Okay, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> there's your lightsaber. Exactly. And then, and it all sort of comes together like that, and it's mm. it is 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 rather incredible how they kind of managed to do that with with very little money. I think Roger actually, I think Roger said to me that they came in under budget. His his budget came in under. He was given a very <laughs> small amount of money, and he had so much to build. Um, yeah, it's so lovely talking to Roger. And if you ever can catch up with any of his interviews, he's he's a wonderful guy. He's and he's yeah, he's he, he lives and breathes it, and and um, still very passionate about. What he did on, on Star Wars to this day, because after Star Wars, he went him and Les Dilly, who was the assistant art director on Star Wars, they went to work on Alien with Ridley Scott, mm -hmm. and uh, they did loads of fantastic work on there. And that's it's say in in Roger's book as well. Um, now here we are. So here, this is more modern times. Yeah, here we are. This, this it's still in the same documentary, but here here we are. This is me and um, Gareth Edwards, so the, the British director who who directed Rogue One. Oh yeah. Um, Star Wars fan himself and he always wanted to be a filmmaker and um, you know for him getting the job on Star Wars was just was just wonderful um, so he went from making um, a very low budget film fantastic film called Monsters um, if you if you've not seen it I can thoroughly recommend it he had a he had a script he had a, he had an idea um, for, I've seen that um, you've seen have you seen the film yeah yes absolutely fantastic brilliant film isn't it so what they did was um, him and Colin Gowdy who also edited Rogue One, mm -hmm. a picture of him next, I think, but um, the, the great friends, great buddies, they, funny enough, they met at the BBC working on documentaries and they, they started chatting about, about Star Wars and they realised they were wasting a lot of time in the edit suite because they were chatting about Star Wars lots. Um, and then uh, Gareth got this, got, this, got this deal to kind of go and make this, this film that he really wanted to make. Uh, and they had a script, they had some actors and, and Gareth was the DP as well um, and they had a very small a crew and they went off to these different countries and they would kind of they would make they'd say right okay so this part of the script is this can we, is there something going on here that we can fit around this mm -hmm. so a very clever way of making a film you have a rough idea for a story or a rough script but then you you kind of you kind of fit things around what you want it to be so that's what he did and then he would do a load of um sign replacement stuff after all the graphics all the special effects he did himself after and that got him noticed. And then from there, he ended up doing the remake, one of the remakes of Godzilla, uh, which is a fantastic movie. And then he got he got the gig on on Rogue One. Um, and I'm biased, but I think it's one of the one of the best Star Wars films, and it's fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, I, and I did say to him in the doc, I said, "What was it like? You know, when when you saw your name directed by Gareth Edwards?" He said, "It." He said, "I can die now." He said, "It's just amazing." <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've I've reached my pinnacle. I can die now. Yeah, exactly. As a kid, you know, as a kid, you know, I remember getting the the top load of VHS machine, sliding in Star Wars, pushing it down, and we had the same. We're about the same age. We sort of chatted about you know those those kind of feelings of 
of putting the, you know, getting that VHS, putting it in and thinking, wow, this is, this is me. I, I love this. I love this film. And uh, yeah, for him to kind of, I mean, for me to make a documentary about it is I'm happy about that because he's <laughs> actually made a Star Wars movie. So, so he, he wins. Um, but yeah, I mean, what a, I mean, a really nice guy as well. And I know that he's, he's, he's still based in LA now and he's doing loads of, he's working on other things at the moment. So mm -hmm. watch this space from, from him. What else have we got here? Oh, okay. That's the book. We're on to the book now. Shall oh, we yeah. talk about the book? Derek? Well, shall talk um, about the book? Yeah. So, so, um, we did the, I did the original documentary. So the original documentary was 60 minutes mm -hmm. and then I went back and remade it. Um, so me and Matt decided, so I was the producer and presenter on, on galaxy and Matt was the director and, and the, and the film editor. And we decided to kind of punt it again and see if we'd get another 30 minutes out of it. We had loads more stuff we'd not put in. Then we got the guys from the London symphony orchestra, which was great. And we had a wonderful lady called Anne Skinner. Uh, tracked her down and she was on continuity on Star Wars. So she tells some great stuff and took all the Polaroids and, and all the stuff. And Lucasfilm gave us permission to, to film the, the annotated scripts and the, the, the Polaroids, which are in the BFI archive, mm -hmm. British Film Institute archive, um, just north of London. So that was fantastic. And um, but, in, but in the background, um, I'd been approached by a couple of publishers who wanted me to, to write a book. And I'd never written a book before. I mean, I do a lot of writing as a journalist, as a filmmaker, um, but I've never written a book before. So I, I redid a load of the interviews. I, I kept in touch with everybody and I emailed them. And we had Skype calls and we had phone chats and stuff. So I thought there's a lot more to tell here. Mm. So I went back to the, to, the, to the transcripts and my transcripts of the interviews were about 120,000 words. It was like, it took me a very <laughs> long time. A lot, of, a lot of midnight oil got, got burnt. It was like, oh my word, I've spent ages doing that. Anyway, just some painful memories. But anyway, so so I kind of started to break it all down. I thought I wanted to tell more than the, than the documentary had um, mm -hmm. and also put in um, some stories that, that weren't just related to Star Wars. So there's stuff in here about you know, Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and Alien. And then, of course, Rogue One. Uh, so you also got Gareth and, and Colin Gowdy in there. So, so a bit of that and the forward was written my friend robert watts said that he would write the forward for the book i was like this doesn't this doesn't happen so <laughs> that was fantastic i was like blown away and then um les dilly and, and and robert said gate said to me that i could use their personal photographs that had never seen the light of day before um I was like, whoa wow. really so didn't didn't put them in the dock there's one or two in the dock but but so we got this is a great one here so this is from this is from um, from Robert in his collection. So you got Ralph McQuarrie there. You got George Lucas in the middle. I want, wouldn't know what they're saying here. And the other gentleman here is Norman Reynolds, who was on the B British production team as well. I think, what, what on earth are they talking about there? It wouldn't, wouldn't be great to know. Obviously, going through artwork or something, you know, something. That, that, that yeah, one. it looks like a cell or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it does, mm. doesn't it? Um, this is a great one because um, you've got Robert Watts here and the, the, and the, the production designer John Barry. And John Barry is one of these people who doesn't really kind of get much, um, doesn't really get much attention. Very sadly, he, he passed away during the production of The Empire Strikes Back. Mm. He had meningitis, um, very talented man, incredibly talented man. Um, and uh, he's, he's in our documentary, but we found some BBC archive of him talking about Star Wars. Um, and this here is a recce for um, The Empire Strikes Back that, and, it's, and uh, obviously a location they never used. Because, you know, the Empire Strikes Back is, you know, set on, you know, they, they filmed in Finsa in Norway, which became pl the ice planet Hoth. Yep. And this this is on the equator at Kenya, um, in Kenya. And, and this they were doing records and trying to work out where they were going to film, you know, the Empire Strikes Back. So it's a very rare picture. You know, you've got Robert there and, and, uh, and, and John Barry. And this, oh, my word, I couldn't believe this. This was amazing. So... I was chatting with Robert's house uh, not quite a while before the, the book was was going into into production, and I was sort of still writing it. And um, this is this is uh, Robert, his wife, and his children outside their house during the heat wave in 1976. And he tells the story that um, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and Mark Hamill, you know, wanted to come round for Sunday lunch, hadn't had Yorkshire puddings and roast beef, etc. So he said, "I'll come over." So so this is. In, in London, 
in a, in a you know very suburban part of London. I just love this. You've got Harrison Ford, you've got Anthony Daniels there as well playing C three PO. You've got Mark Hamill pulling a face with his hat on, and you've got Pat Carr, Robert Watts's um, assistant. Robert's there. Robert's wife and children. And I said, "Where's Carrie?" He said, "Oh, she took the picture." <laughs> <laughs> So there we are, isn't that fantastic? So, and then apparently they had a water fight in the garden after that. It was instigated by Mark because it was the heat wave of 1976. I say heat wave, I mean, compared to where you are, it'd probably be very normal. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, heat it, wave. It was, it was 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was 15 and a half degrees Celsius in the UK. And we all got very excited. And People the ice cream was melting. Yeah, exactly. The tarmac <laughs> started to melt. So, yeah, I mean, just stories like this. I mean, you know, that's, you yeah. know, that picture has been tucked away in a family album for you know forty years. And, um, yeah, and, that's that's. I mean, that's that's just time lost. That is. Yeah, and and to kind of be given permission to use that was for me was just absolutely fantastic. So yeah, there's loads more pictures, loads more behind the scenes stuff of, of filming on Star Wars that Les Dilly very kindly uh, let me use as well. So there's loads of stuff in the book that that's that's not really been seen before. Uh, oh, we're on Toy Empire. We've, we've already talked about Toy Empire. So there are, <laughs> oh look i like toy empire yeah. toy, toy empire was really really good it was so well put together thank you um, well i just i just i just whiz a couple of bits so here we got the production line yeah this one we're talking about um, the production lines and um so just basically yeah. you know putting these things together and uh and screwing them down and well actually the, the millennium falcon actually has some screws in it if i remember right yeah it did yeah yeah um i <laughs> i spent um a disproportionate amount of money on ebay finding the, re the replacement parts for my Falcon. <laughs> and I actually would have been cheaper to have bought an old second-hand one intact. <laughs> As I discovered afterwards, I thought that was just ridiculous. But it's my Falcon, Terry, and I wanted it to... You want it to stuff. be original, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And here we are. Imagine you know, all these toys going off the off the production line, the, the fantastic... you know. The, the I remember the side of these things used to open up. That's right, yeah, they did. They used to I've be able to put the little stormtroopers in there and everything like that. <laughs> So I think a friend of mine had one. And they got the pegs on the side of the legs. Yes. Yeah, the pegs on the side of the leg, legs, and you could put them as if they were kind of climbing up, as if it was Luke yep. climbing up to kind of put the put the, 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 the charge inside to blow it up. And it, this is fantastic. Look at this. I mean, this is what went to the trade, you know. So these guys saying, you know, look, look at all these all these statistics and everything and how well it was doing. Um, and it's sad, isn't it? Look, if you look at the date here, um, January 1984, and you know this is after <laughs> um, Return of Jedi had, had, had mm. come out, and I think that Jeff Maisie, who was the marketing director um, for for Palato at the time, said in the in the documentary, he said, "Yeah, we thought it was going to go on. You know, we couldn't see, you know, but of course we did know it went on, but it took a long time. There were kind of the wilderness yeah. years of Star Wars, um, and then and then it all, it all came back again. Um, and somebody said to me, "Oh, how long did it take you to make the Galaxy Britain book?" I said, "Well, I've probably been making it my entire life." <laughs> <laughs> because you know, being a Star Wars fan, it's always it's always been there. Oh, and there I am as a figure. I don't know. You you probably saw that in the documentary. Yeah, you've got your um, own action figure. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I did. But this is the best one. They didn't really see the light of day. So there we go. That's uh, <laughs> that's, that's my favorite one. Uh, that sits in my office. Um, yeah. So I worry about the crotch area. But there we go. The question <laughs> is: Do you do you actually have a stormtrooper costume? No. No, I Why don't have not? any. I know I should. I should. Ah, oh, seriously, um, seriously. I mean, the five hundred first guys would whip you one up in three seconds flat. They probably would. They, well, they've got right, all the they they, they've got all the all the uh, the molds and everything for it. It's all just vacuum formed. So right. they they they'd rip you one out. Yeah, you'd have, you'd have oh. the whole thing done. Oh, don't, don't 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 don't. I'm trying to be good, not spend any more money at the moment. I'm just trying to be. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be well behaved. <laughs> Actually, well behaved. So, uh, so there we are. So that's so, it. That's, try not to good. spend any money. <laughs> Meanwhile, yes, behind this green screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this isn't real. This is this is like. No, I love your background. That's fantastic. So that's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me. It's kind of a an insight to it. I mean, it's you know we were very lucky they that the documentaries went out in the UK. I'm hoping they'll go out, you know, internationally at some point. Um, Toy Empire is going to be going out on BBC World. Very soon. Well, yeah, so I mean, I, I actually had to get a get a copy from you so I could, um, mm. you know, watch them because they're not available on YouTube or anything like that. No, no, because um, because so. of, 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 of copyright, they can't go on. They yeah. can't go on YouTube and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, the Galaxy Britain built has been on BBC World, um, the original version, 
Um, and I'm pleased to say, you're the first I'm telling this to live, is that as far as I know, these things are subject to change. Um, <laughs> the 15th and 16th of August, mm -hmm. the Toy, Toy Empire will be screened four times on BBC World across the world. So, so local listings, I'm, I'll be putting it out on Twitter and on, on, on my Instagram and telling people when that's going to be. Oh, yeah. As and, far as I know. You know, for yeah. anyone who's watching oh. and everyone who's going to be watching, you know, seriously, watch it because it is brilliant. It's half an hour Thank of, you. I mean, I... I was norm normally I'll put a doco on and you know it'll be on the side screen somewhere and I'll be working away. Yeah, I couldn't work while I was watching that because it was just. Oh, thank you. No, it was full of information. There was something always going. There was something always, um, you know, there, there was it was just it was good. It was really oh, good. Thank you, Terry. That's really, I, I, that means a lot. Thank you so much. That's great. No, no that's it's, all right. Just tell yeah. them the truth, mate. Tell them the truth. It was yeah, good. Thank you. It was. It was. I, I will say it was a bit of a. It was a bit of a. I. I <laughs> What happened was I, I booked straight to the channel of, of, of BBC Four in the UK and said, "Look, we can. It's coming up to the end of you know, the Rise of Skywalker's coming out. So this is about this time last year. I just got the commission to redo Galaxy and do Toy Empire. And I said, "Look," and I honestly thought they'd say one or what, yes to one of them, but mm -hmm. I pitched a Star Wars night of the week that Rise of Skywalker was coming out, and they said yes to both." And at first I ran around the house going, yes. And then I thought, <laughs> oh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Just so, a little bit. <laughs> as, well as, as well as all my regular stuff, my regular TV series were going out in the autumn as well. And I do a radio show and all these other bits and bobs. And I thought, oh, how am I going to do that? Well, I, I didn't take a day off right up until December. But um, Yeah, 20 hour was, days. What was it? 20 yeah, hour days, three days in a row, <laughs> sleeping on the yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that was, yeah, that was Nick. That, that was, was Nick. Nick. <laughs> uh, no, I, I never topped that. Um, but it, well, what a privilege, to be fair, Terry, to kind of speak to these people and to, to kind of you know get it out there. And we had we had such lovely reviews. You know, they got pick of the day, Critics' Choice in all the papers in the UK, four stars, and and um, yeah, we were we were blown away, really. But what was I think uh, it's very much the same in your world as well, isn't it? You have to get everything right. You have to get everything absolutely. Oh, look, I mean. In the, both both in Toy Empire and and the documentary, um, you got you got it spot on. I mean, Thank you. the the feeling of, I suppose it's hard to explain because while I was watching it, I was riveted the whole time, and I was feeling yeah you know, every, every feeling every little emotion going through it. And I'm not a Star Wars fan. <laughs> You know, this, yeah, this, 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 this is, this is my only Star Wars shirt. <laughs> that's, but, that, but that's the thing. And I said to you, and I said this off air, if you like, but my wife doesn't get Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I, I forced her to watch, <laughs> forced her. Uh, <laughs> I, I begged her, I begged her to watch Star Wars, um, the original, you know, New Hope a couple of years ago. And she watched it and she quite enjoyed it. But I think unless you, maybe if you don't get into it when you're a kid, maybe this is not good. But she enjoyed the documentaries because I think any story, whatever it is, whether you're talking about, you know, whatever the story is, and it's what I've done as a sort of filmmaker, as long as you, you know, um, human endeavour is what makes a story, isn't it? Whatever it exactly. may be. Uh, whether you're following you know, a heart-rending story or a heart-wrenching story or a, a positive story, a celebratory story, it's all about, as humans, we are curious about other humans and we want to know what it took to do something whatever that may be. And I, and I think that was what we we're trying to do with the toy empire and, and, and galaxy. Um, and they're just really nice people. And it's like you sitting in the room with these really nice people talking about something and they're so modest about it as well. Oh yeah. Well, that's, I mean, most people don't understand what goes into making a film. You know, mm. they, 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 they watch an hour and a half of a movie and it's like, Oh, that's nice. <laughs> they don't realize the last, what, yeah. the last three years of, of, you know, 200 people's lives have been devoted yeah. to this one thing yeah. exactly. and uh, it's, every it's every waking it. moment and um but actually actually you know going in and, and talking to those people and um uh, and and getting their story that was that was just the best oh it was just i mean i, I we were there were so many i mean honestly i won't bore you with it all but there were so many problems we had with with the doc um so many things didn't come you know on time and things didn't happen on time and and um when we interviewed nick we had to go we went to go and see him had to go we went to go see him in the caribbean as one does uh, <laughs> so we filmed with him there 
And, um, tough, and then tough gig there. This tough, it was tough. <laughs> but then we didn't actually have the, the insurance in place because that hadn't been sorted out. We thought it had to get the permits to film in LA. And we were flying the next day to LA. So we had all these interviews lined up and we had to film at, uh, on Hollywood Boulevard and uh, at the Griffith Observatory for the Hollywood sign, all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and do three interviews. We didn't have permission. We didn't have the, we didn't have the insurance in place. Because then you have to go to, to, the get, to film LA to get the permit. Mm-hmm. And of course, you can't just film anywhere you like. So, so I was absolutely, and it literally came in like 11th hour, and we were able to do it because I thought we we're going to get to LA. And I'm just going to be so sitting there on the beach at, at uh, Santa yeah, Monica, just twiddling your thumbs. Just, just yeah. twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> um, yeah, we did have a quick look at Santa Monica, but that there wasn't much down. Oh, San, much Santa, Mon- Santa Monica, Third Street Promenade. You know, the yeah, pier. No, no, no time. Venice I literally Beach. ran to look at it. I ran <laughs> to look at it. I said, I've got to check this. I've got to say I've seen it. I've seen the Pacific. So I ran because I, 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 I surfed the North Sea. I don't, I've never surfed the Pacific. There's no, there's no surf there whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, isn't there? Right. Okay. Oh. Anyway, I ran. I ran. I ran. I said to, I said to Matt, I said, just because the cameraman was somewhere else. There's only three of us on the crew. So I ran off to the, just to look at it, just to say I'd seen it. And that was it. And I said, I've seen it, that's it. And then we, and then we left. I think I had half a day off. But it, And then we got home. And then we had, um, and then we had uh, an interview with Gary Kurtz, who was wonderful. And sadly, Gary's no longer with us, you know, the, the producer, the American producer of, of Star Wars and, and The Empire Strikes Back. And uh, yeah, I, I managed to contact his, his wife recently. And I've, I've sent her a copy of the book. And we've kind of kept in touch, which is nice. Um, and, and also Roger Christian. We flew him over from Canada. And did the interview with him, and then once we got all those in the can, it was like, oh, wow, we got him, we got him. No, the the interviews were fantastic. I mean, if you know, if anyone wants to or gets a chance to see it, um, or you know, obviously, I'll I'll throw up some links to your book as well. Um, Thank for you. People, That's very kind. For people that want to buy the book, because you know, some people like to read these things. Me, I like to watch these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, look, the documentary was fantastic. Um, Thank you. Toy Empire was fantastic. Now, have you got any plans for the future that you can talk about? Well, you see, it's interesting. Um, I have. I've got a bit because when 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 everything went crazy at Christmas, I did a lot of podcasts, a lot of interviews with, with newspapers and stuff, and a lot of Star Wars podcasts. Everyone said to me, "What's next? What's next?" And at that point, I was just going, "I just want to rest." I I know the feeling. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Of course you do. You think you just you just you've done that. You've done a major project or two major projects, whatever it is, and you think I just I just feel I need to rest. But of course, um, my my TV show went on to the end of March, and then of course, sadly, the whole world's been devastated by by coronavirus. So um, so it's sort of been working from home. So I've got a few. Not much is happening in the in kind of that world at the moment. I'm hoping it won't take long. So um, I've got a two or three ideas. Um, so watch this space. I've been, I've been approached by some people to do some stuff that might take off for next year. Um, so maybe some convention kind of stuff. Um, but I'd love to make some more docs and I've got a few and I'm, I'm well, running them by some of my Star Wars buddies who, well, who are going to just look at things. Fancy, fancy <laughs> you should say that because I reckon there's going to be, um, I don't think there's ever been a Warhammer doc. Oh, oh. A games no, workshop has, document. Actually. No, I don't know how it has, is there? Oh. Oh, right. Okay. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Plan, Terry. <laughs> Sorry, it's actually plan, Terry. Um, yeah, you see, this is, this is the thing. And, and Warhammer is absolutely massive. So oh, it's beyond massive. Already, I mean, oh. you've already got an audience, a huge audience, you know, such a following that, that it's a no brainer. You see, all these things now. Uh, it used to be, it's like Star Wars and Warhammer, it always to be so underground. And now it is everywhere. Now it's everywhere because of the internet, because you find kindred spirits, and that's how these things grow, isn't it? And I think that... Oh, come on, um, Dungeons and Dragons, please. We used to oh, we yes, used to, we used to just hide away and pretend that... we No, 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 we don't play that. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> off, we'd run, off we'd run to a basement oh. somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's so true, it's so true. But it was like a secret cool society. Be a <laughs> yeah, Being but a, now... Yeah. You know, Nerds have taken over the world. We we can we can come out of our, our shells. But I, I I do think that you know there are so many platforms out there for this now, and you know there are so many streaming services that need this kind of content. And you know you've got an audience there already. Mm, exactly. So Warhammer is a, is an ideal one. 
So, I mean, I just build costumes. That's all I do. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you don't just build costumes, though, Terry, do you? You build <laughs> the most amazing costumes. Uh, and I know that having, having interviewed you, this is really weird because it's the other way around because last time we spoke <laughs> on this, I was interviewing you for another thing. So it's, it's very nice for you to interview me. And I'm very flattered. So thank well, you. Well, I mean, as I said, Unsung Heroes, I mean, people like yourself, they don't get interviewed. They don't get um, a chance to, to say their piece and to tell their story. So that's what this oh, is all well, thank about. You. Well, so, that's very um, kind of you, mate. I appreciate it. All right. What else is on your plate? What else What else would you like to um, talk about in the, in the last few minutes we've got? Um, well, I, I, as I say, I've, 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 I've kind of... I'm not sure whether start whether we could do another Star Wars one. I've always I've, I've always thought about doing another Star Wars. You're one. a massive Star Wars fan, okay? Mm-hmm. So, and and given that you've got you've got the knowledge, you've got the 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 right verbiage to be able to pull the information out of the people involved. Well, I you know, I, I, to be fair, I've been a, I've been you know in broadcasting for 25 years, so I. I've always sat. I've sat down and done. I've literally done thousands of interviews. That's the that's the weird thing. Um, so I suppose you know I've got a lot of experience in 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 doing that. But I think my advice to anybody if you're ever going to do an interview with something is to kind of. I and mean, I've watched a lot of interviews with people involved with Star Wars, and you would see the interviewer. It becomes about the interviewer, and as opposed to about the interviewee. And I always thought that, you know, if you, you ask a question, sit back and just let them, let them tell their Let them, tell let them go. Piece. Just let them, let yeah. them say their so, yeah. yeah, so for example, um, with Roger, Roger's interview, the Raw interview is three and a half hours long. So <laughs> just, it just just Roger Christian's interview is three and a half hours. So you've got to kind of, it's it's a, it's being curious, isn't it? And, and, and having the deference, I suppose, to, to kind of step back and listen to what, what they got to say and yeah uh, see and, and this is where with the with the warhammer side of things I, I i fall over because like i can't interview warhammer people because i don't know the verbiage i don't know like you know they, they start talking about primarchs and uh and and bits and pieces and you know and, and cha- different chapters and i haven't got a clue i'm just like Phew. oh no that's interesting no, that's interesting you say that terry because pe- the bbc press office dubbed me as a super fan they called me the super fan to kind of promote everything which is very nice very flattering but I don't know all the kind of expanded universe stuff. I don't read the comics. People think, oh, you're not, you're not a super fan then? Well, no, I, did, I, I didn't purport to be a super fan in that sense, but I, hmm. I understand Star Wars, but I, I wouldn't know who the third, you know, the third creature from the, you know, the back row is, you know, and, and what their background history is and, uh, you know, how they came to be in the cantina at that particular moment, whereas real super fans could, could probably tell you that, but I could tell you about the production of it, and that's... That's what has been, and that's more valuable to me. And anyway, is is the production, <laughs> the behind the scenes <laughs> side <right>. of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, so. mean, I think I think all, all behind the scenes stuff is great. I mean, I, I've just started watching um, the Gallery of the Mandalorian on Disney Plus, and and how they they made the Mandalorian. That's that's great. You know, Actually, that, <laughs> speaking about Mandalorian, um, a friend of mine, Alex Choate, he was the uh, co- the director of continuity on Guardsmen, um, and he was he's actually made a screen accurate version. Oh wow. And I mean it's oh, it's word. it's glorious. So are he's we, actually he's, I need to see that. He's a he's a props builder in, in LA. So what I might do actually at some stage is I might get him and you on at the same time and we'll yeah, we might even get a few other Great. Kind of, you know Great. prop builders, etc. and we'll start throwing some props around. Oh, that's <laughs> a good idea. Yeah, I, I haven't got any props, but I can, I can certainly be, be no, Oh you can, you can you can you can host it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. I could do that. That's good. I could I could talk the hind legs off a donkey. So that's fine. I could just do that. But um, but uh, yeah, that'd be superb. Anything anything we could chat about, we love you, Terry. But yeah, they're actually there. I mean, Alex and a few others are, are working on active projects right now, even with COVID going, uh, which is really mm-hmm. really really good for them. You know, they yeah. are working from home out of their out of their home workshops, um, yeah. but they're they're managing to get through this well troubled time. Um, yeah, it is, and it is, and and you know, they will. It will certainly affect a lot of the industry, um, you know, throughout the world. Um, and I don't know what they're going to be putting on television in the autumn across the country because oh. there'll be no, there'll be nothing new. Will there, reruns, sadly? reruns. Yeah, it will be. It will be. And uh, maybe in the UK they could rerun the Galaxy Britain built and uh, Toy Empire. I'll I reckon they season. should. I reckon they should. <laughs> All right, David. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And, thank you. Uh, and you know. Uh, 
waffling with me and i know no, you it's been great i've enjoyed it i'm sorry it's whiz by it's actually whiz by it's, i know it has <laughs> it's flown by it's past the yard on now so i can have a beer so there we are oh yeah no it's past 12 go and get your beer <laughs> <laughs> thank you my friend all right and 